Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 52, Lunar Operations Retrospective. Last time, we followed Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt to Taurus Littrow on Apollo 17. After an uneventful descent and landing, the crew shattered the records with more EVA time, more driving, and infinitely more geologists. When their three-day stay on the surface and additional two days in lunar orbit were over, we assumed entry attitude and rode along for the final moon-based splashdown. And now here we are, in a somewhat awkward position where I keep correcting myself from saying that the Apollo program is over, but there is undeniably a milestone we are passing. There are still four Apollo flights left, but none that would go to the moon. To me, this is a perfect time to hit the pause button, look back on those lunar flights with a quick refresher on how we got there, and think about their impact. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union changed the world forever. It was on that day that a small metal sphere named Sputnik was lofted into the heavens atop a modified ballistic missile, becoming the world's first artificial satellite, an artificial moon. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's literally the first few sentences of this entire podcast. But it really is a good place to start. What was viewed by the Soviet Union largely as a stunt was viewed by the United States as an existential threat. If they could launch Sputnik over us, they could launch anything. The space race was on. Fast forward a few years, and the Soviet Union has launched a human into orbit. Again, from their perspective, this was mostly just to show off how cool they were, and was not intended to be the beginning of any lengthy stay in space. But the United States interpreted this as the dawn of a Soviet-dominated solar system and went a little crazy. In May of 1961, just a few weeks after our first pitiful suborbital human flight in Project Mercury, President Kennedy declared that we would land a crew on the moon before the decade was out. This was even remotely possible due to a bit of good luck. Massive rocket engines were already being developed, since in the 1950s the Air Force just assumed they would need them, and they take so long to build that they figured they better get started. A larger, more complex spacecraft named Apollo was already being tentatively designed as a follow-up to Project Mercury. And at the same time, advances in digital electronics and computers were being made just when a moon program would really need them. It could be done. Maybe. For the next two years, NASA scrambled to set the stage for Apollo while flying America's first tentative missions in space as part of Project Mercury. Before long, it was obvious that Apollo would not be ready in time to avoid a lengthy flight hiatus. It was also obvious that the lunar landing program would require techniques that could not be tested in the primitive Mercury spacecraft. To fill in the gaps, Project Gemini was spun up. Over 10 rapid-fire flights in 20 months, Gemini greatly expanded the envelope of our spaceflight capabilities and really cleared the path for Apollo's success. NASA wrapped up Project Gemini and was about to go roaring into Apollo when tragedy struck. A test that was considered safe and routine soon became anything but. While Apollo 1 sat on the pad during the plugs-out test, a fire was sparked and in the pure oxygen environment of the spacecraft, burned with a fury nothing could withstand. The spacecraft was lost. The crew was lost. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee will be forever remembered among those who gave their lives for the cause of human spaceflight. What followed was an extensive investigation, numerous engineering changes, and a lot of soul-searching. Apollo emerged from the accident safer, more capable, and laser-focused on its goal. After a hiatus of 21 months, longer than the entirety of Project Gemini, Apollo 7 carried the torch forward and became the first piloted flight of the Apollo program. Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and Walt Cunningham flew this 10-day shakedown of the Block 2 command and service module and confirmed that the spacecraft was ready to fly. Well, two out of three spacecraft. The lunar module, the vehicle that would actually descend to the surface, was not quite ready. So NASA pivoted and turned a liability into an asset. Rather than wait several months for the first LEM to be ready for a test flight in low Earth orbit, NASA looked further. What was to stop the next flight from going all the way to the moon? Not to land, but to orbit. Okay, there was plenty to stop it. The required Saturn V rocket had only flown twice before and had barely made it into orbit on one of those flights, 
there had only been one other piloted flight of the command and service module, nobody had been that far from home in case of an emergency before, there were plenty of reasons not to go. But, well, if we're going to be doing this for realsies in a few months, why be scared now? What resulted was a trailblazing mission that I think marks a new epic of humanity, Apollo 8. It also happens to be my favorite mission, along with all my other favorite missions. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders left the Earth behind, flew around the moon ten times, and returned to tell the tale. The flight gathered valuable engineering data, validated the Apollo hardware in the lunar environment, and reinvigorated the space program and the nation. Next up, Apollo 9, a flight that is often overlooked, despite its complexity and importance. A shakedown flight of the full Apollo stack of command, service, and lunar modules, it saw the only time the lunar module would fly free with humans aboard in low Earth orbit. CSM Gumdrop and Lem Spider tested all of the hardware and confirmed that the Lem could do the job. Jim McDivitt, David Scott, and Rusty Schweikart may not be as remembered as some astronauts, but they completed a difficult mission and answered the questions that needed to be answered. After that, the dress rehearsal for the landing, Apollo 10. Only a little more than six months remained until the decade was out and we still had a lot to do, and Tom Stafford, Gene Cernan, and John Young were up to the task. And yes, I know, technically the decade wasn't out until the end of 1970, but I think if NASA tried to pull a, well, technically, the world would have rightfully called shenanigans on them. Anyway, in May of 1969, the full Apollo stack flew again, and this time to the moon. CSM Charlie Brown and Lunar Module Snoopy separated in lunar orbit as Snoopy performed all actions required for a landing, except for the landing. After doing a few dramatic barrel rolls due to an incorrect attitude setting, the crew returned safely home. Then in July 1969, perhaps the most famous spaceflight in history, Apollo 11, the first time humans landed on the moon. What was, of course, a momentous achievement seems in retrospect simple and almost bare bones compared to the later missions. Mike Collins stayed in orbit while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed in the middle of nowhere, hopped outside for about two hours, and got home as soon as possible. Apollo 11's role was to achieve Kennedy's goal, but also really to serve as a technology demonstrator. For the first time, the entire system had been used and had performed basically as expected. While often thought of as the end, it was really just the beginning of lunar operations. Just a few short months later, Apollo 12 upped the ante. Commander Pete Conrad and LMP Alan Bean put their LEM down within spitting distance of the uncrewed probe Surveyor 3, as Dick Gordon held down the fort in orbit. They proved the LEM could be piloted with precision, deployed some upgraded science experiments, did two surface EVAs instead of one, and brought home some pieces of Surveyor 3 to study. Five months later, one of the few flights that can give Apollo 11 a run for its money when it comes to notoriety, Apollo 13. The flight of Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert is widely known for being a successful failure. 200,000 miles away from the Earth, a spark in an oxygen tank in the service module triggered a series of reactions that resulted in a crippled spaceship and a crew in peril. The next few days were the stuff of spaceflight legend as the crew and mission control improvised and endured a long, dark, and cold flight. The crew was returned safely, and the program lived on. After an eight-month hiatus to ensure that the cause of the accident was well understood and repaired, Apollo 14 launched. Commanded by Mercury 7 astronaut Alan Shepard, his presence alone would make the flight pretty noteworthy, especially since he had been grounded on medical reasons for nearly a decade. But the flight itself made sure that it would be plenty memorable no matter who commanded it. Docking issues, landing radar problems, and a floating ball of solder sending erroneous computer commands all did their best to thwart the landing but Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell became the third crew to land on the moon, and Stu Rusa became the fourth person to orbit the moon on his own. They performed the longest traverse to date, but became disoriented and missed their destination by just a few hundred feet. The mission was a success, but brushed up against the limitations of foot-bound astronauts. Those limitations changed on the next flight, Apollo 15. Apollo 15 kicked off the J missions, which brought upgraded hardware and a sharper focus than ever on science. 
CMP Al Warden became a one-man science platform during his lonely stay in lunar orbit, collecting a wealth of data. Meanwhile, David Scott and Jim Irwin descended to Hadley Apennine for three days on the surface. Employing the new lunar rover, a specialized electric car, the crew shattered all previous distance records and collected more data and samples than any previous crew. The flight was marred by controversy due to the crew selling postage covers carried on the flight, but as those memories fade, it is more and more remembered as the nearly perfect flight that it was. Apollo 16 was next. John Young, Charlie Duke, and Ken Mattingly knew the end was in sight and were determined to squeeze all they could from their mission. But due to a gimbal problem in the service module's rocket engine, the landing was nearly called off while in lunar orbit. Tense hours followed as schematics were studied, telemetry dissected, and landing trajectories updated. After getting the green light, John Young set lunar module Orion down only six hours later than planned. The crew became the first to explore the lunar highlands, probing the volcanic history of the moon. With no new major pieces of equipment being added to the picture, this could be considered one of the few operational, as opposed to experimental, flights. That's how I think of it, at least. And lastly, Apollo 17. Just four short years after Apollo 8 slipped behind the moon's face, the final lunar landing mission had arrived. Ron Evans gathered invaluable data in orbit, while Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt descended to Taurus Littrow. With only one flight remaining, the crew rotation was shaken up, and Harrison Schmidt got one of the coveted last two seats to the moon, becoming the only scientist to walk on its face. Gene Cernan and his geologist crewmate spent three days performing the longest EVAs and farthest traverses to date, wringing all that they could out of the Taurus Littrow Valley. And while they would have loved to stay longer, you can't argue with life support backpacks, so when the time came, they said a few words, clambered aboard their spaceship, and departed for home. It was over. So, what did we get? One way to look at this is just the raw numbers. In a four-year period, 24 astronauts flew to the moon. 12 of them landed. Three of them flew there twice. Over the course of nine moonbound flights, six missions landed, with two remaining in orbit, and one flying by on a free return trajectory. The lunar modules spent a total of 299 hours, 34 minutes, and 51 seconds on the surface. The astronauts were outside for 80 hours, 32 minutes, and 26 seconds over the span of 15 EVAs. While out there, they traveled 60.75 miles, with Apollo 17 alone contributing 22 of them. And when they lifted off, they brought home 841.55 pounds of rocks and dust, all for the low, low cost of $222 billion in 2018 dollars. Which brings me to a question I spend a lot of time thinking about. Was it worth it? Was the Apollo program a good idea? I think a lot of space fans take this for granted, but it's really worth thinking over. I suppose this is a good time to remind you that I don't speak for NASA and this is just my take on all this, but my answer is yes. I know, very controversial. In a lot of ways, the Apollo program was a happy accident. Kennedy didn't really want to go. Russia didn't really want to go. And to a large extent, even early NASA didn't really want to go. It was so much, so fast, so soon. It completely disrupted the natural development of the nascent space program. And with such a tight deadline, it was a crash program. No serious thoughts were really given to sustainability or a long-term vision. And if they were, they were quickly set aside in favor of getting the job done now as soon as possible. The Saturn V could have been put through a more rigorous testing program. The spacecraft could have been designed to be reusable or had wings for a runway landing. The hardware could have been designed for more than just a few short hours on the lunar surface. Lots of compromises were made in the face of pressure exerted by the approaching end of the decade. That kind of pressure can be beneficial because it focuses effort so sharply, but it also inexorably draws the program to what's expedient today. The Apollo program was destined to succeed, but was also set up to fail. As soon as the staggering amounts of required money started to dry up, the whole thing fell apart, and we haven't been back since. I think everything I just said is true, but it also paints an unnecessarily bleak picture. 
For one thing, it's important to remember that they didn't just take that $222 billion, mount it to the top of a Saturn V, and launch it into orbit. That money was spent here on Earth. The aerospace industry got a massive shot in the arm, creating countless new jobs and technologies that themselves enabled other new jobs and technologies. Even the planning project methodologies developed for Apollo continue to exert their influence today when planning modern megaprojects. And while the hundreds of thousands of layoffs that resulted from Apollo's collapse were awful, they also unleashed a horde of eager and capable engineers, ready to tackle other problems. But the Apollo program also did more than just invigorate the aerospace industry, bring back 841 pounds of rocks, develop new technologies, and serve as a giant jobs program. It inspired a generation. How many people are scientists and engineers today because of the Apollo program? Even those who didn't experience it for themselves were impacted. I mean, just look at me. I was born more than a decade after Apollo 17, and here I am. That intangible impact is too massive and too ephemeral to really quantify. That kind of energy gets into everyone's heads. It reminds them what's possible. That even if we aren't flying to the moon anymore, even if things sometimes get really, really, really bad, we are a species capable of going anywhere and doing anything. If we decide to do it. It reminds us that there is a future. A future where we will accomplish great things, unthinkable things, when we're ready. Plus, you know, we beat Russia, so that's nice. So what's next? The final lunar landing is behind us. The Apollo program is done, right? Not quite yet. Back in the mid-1960s, the prospect for Apollo's future was a little loftier. Not only were there going to be more lunar landings, but there were going to be so many launchers, spacecraft, and astronauts that other uses for Apollo hardware began to be developed. It didn't hurt that this was also something useful to work on for NASA centers whose role in Apollo wound down earlier than others. The result was Apollo Applications, a program to use Apollo hardware for tasks other than the lunar landing missions. There was some pretty heady stuff in there, including extended-duration lunar bases, space telescopes, and even a human flyby of Venus. All programs like this eventually get whittled down a bit to match where the most interest is, where the most return on investment is, and where the funding is. So while we didn't get a flyby of Venus, we did get something pretty incredible. Skylab, a massive space station that played host to three crews of astronauts over the course of about a year. It resulted in a massive amount of data on everything from solar science to biology and microgravity to the logistics of operating such a long-duration space mission. And just when you thought Apollo was done, there was one last flight, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, the first international docking in space. So that's the immediate future for the space above us. Longtime listeners may recall that the original intent of this show was to only do one episode per mission. This was partially to try to say that all missions are interesting, so they should all get equal treatment, but also simple logistics. I allowed myself to indulge a little in the Apollo program, but we have 169 missions to get through, and believe it or not, we've only covered 30. As much fun as I'm having, I can't keep this thing going forever, so at some point I need to get back to one episode per mission. My original plan was to do that for Skylab, but the more I learned about these lengthy and fascinating missions, the more I realized that that just wasn't going to work. So, while everything is subject to change as usual, here is the tentative plan going forward. The next two episodes will be about Skylab itself. Where it came from, how it was made, how NASA prepared for it, and how we got it into orbit. Then I'm leaning towards two episodes for each of the three missions to the orbital platform. After that will be the Apollo-Soyuz test project, which I think we should be able to cover in one episode. With the Apollo-Soyuz test project behind us, we'll truly be done with the Apollo program. What follows that is the Space Transportation System, aka the Space Shuttle. Covering the shuttle is a massive undertaking. The vehicle itself is stupendously complex, but with 135 missions to talk about, the sheer volume of activity is a little intimidating. So the tentative plan will be to do an introductory series, much like I did with Apollo. It'll be a few standalone episodes dedicated to stuff like the early history and formation of the Space Shuttle Project, 
the orbiter itself, along with other elements of the shuttle stack, how operations worked, and all that good stuff. It buys me a little more time to immerse myself in the shuttle before the mission episodes, and I think it'll be a good orientation for everyone who is a little hazy on the broad strokes of the shuttle program. So, two episodes for Skylab, two episodes each for the three Skylab missions, one episode for ASTP, and then Space Shuttle Introductory Series. That's the tentative plan. I know that's a little boilerplate, especially after getting all misty-eyed about the impact of the Apollo program, but, you know, this seemed like a natural place to talk about it, and I wanted to keep you all in the loop. So I'll leave you now to go back to my towering stacks of books about Skylab and Space Shuttle. As always, if you'd like to get in contact with me and say you like the show, you hate the show, or you have some great recommendations on books and materials about Skylab and the Space Shuttle, you can reach me via Twitter at at space above us, via email at jp at the space above dot us, or the show's Facebook page at facebook.com slash the space above us. I really had a blast bringing the lunar landings to you, and I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. And if you did, it helps me a lot if you could take just a moment to give me a decent review on iTunes or recommend the show to your friends. I think there is only one appropriate way to close out our look at the lunar landings. On September 12, 1962, President John F. Kennedy said, We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force of good or ill depends on man, and only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war? I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea, but I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made and extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind, and its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.